Hi guys, Simeon here. Another day back on the farm where still chat like the kiddos are keeping us quite awake at night. But this kind of stuff is the best way to get him on the normal schedule here. Oh, you're making another one? Good job. You guys have heard me talk about this over and over again, that we don't like feeding silage to our cows. Um, we just, because of the drought, had to buy some silage. We're mixing it now with our hay, um, which is better than just feeding silage. So you see, there's some, um, let me make it a little brighter for you guys. There's some fairly uh, dry hay, and then you have this which is silage, it's not soaking silage, but it is fermented grass. Um, hay, it's just dried grass. At Joel Solitan Farms, I asked him specifically about um, silage in cattle, and here was his really good response. Maybe you could just, for our viewers, um, explain real quick why you don't feed grain, what, what the bad impact is on the cow and the, the oh, meat, sure. the product, oh, and, right. and also um, silage, which is very similar. You know. Right, yeah. right. Well, uh, you know, first of all, an herbivore, an herbivore um, the most grain an herbivore will normally eat in nature would be to pull some seed heads off of a grass plant yeah. you know, that, that, that's seeding out. But you know, that, that is a very uh, Small na narrow yeah. time of the season, mm -hmm. and it's a very tiny part of their diet. And that's that's on a perennial. Right. A perennial is not an annual. Yeah. And so the whole plant eating uh, is significant for the the rumen for the the, you know, the cow uh, herbivore has four stomachs, and for that rumen and the the correct uh, pH balance in that rumen and the the microbial life in that rumen, uh, which has an effect on on the nutrition that you're putting in mi in milk or meat. And so grain feeding uh, creates an, an, it acidulates the rumen, it makes the rumen more acid, which makes it more able to handle um, bacteria that harm us. Yeah. Uh, for example, you know, uh, E. coli, mm -hmm. for example, E. coli is a, is a digestive enzyme in an herbivore. Well, under the normal pH of an herbivore, which would normally be around, let's say, 7 pH, fairly neutral, our stomachs are five, mm -hmm. okay, we're a lot more acid. So if we happen to get some of that herbivore E. coli in us, normally it's just, it's just uh, killed off by our acid, you know, it can't survive. The problem is when you feed herbivores grain, it makes their pH drop more acidic and so the bacteria and the digestive, uh, uh, you know, uh, bacteria are more acclimated to an acidic environment. So when we get them, they kill us. Yeah. Because uh, we because they're already acclimated. Mm -hmm. and, and so you know, there there are a lot of there, there are nutritional issues. Mm -hmm. uh, I already mentioned conjugated linoleic acid, but there there are others. You know, riboflavin, the, the B vitamins, which are the uh, the anti-stress vitamins. You know, wonder why you know people are flying off the handle and you know, going into depression and having problems. Well, you know, our, our grass-finished beef has 300% more riboflavin than feedlot beef. Wow. Uh, and, and when you consider that that's what keeps you emotionally not depressed or not volatile, uh, you know, it keeps you on an even keel, you can begin to see how a culture, when you start depriving it of that riboflavin, guess what? You get Volatility on both ends of the spectrum, suicide, and um, whatever terrorism. You know, yeah. you know on both. Okay, right. so so uh, th those are those two extremes. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so th then you go then you go to silage, mm -hmm. and uh, of course which, which is a fermented that's whole plant, uh, which we could argue is better mm -hmm. than the grain feeding, uh, but it, it's whole plant. But again, it's acid. It's the low, same low issue. PH. It's still it's still acid. It's the low pH acid in general. Uh, I would never recommend feeding more than 15% of the diet as, as a silage. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, a, a, a little treat isn't going to hurt anybody. Uh, in fact, you know, if I had a, a family milk cow, 
I'd give her a you know a cup of sweet feed every day. A cow will fall you off a cliff right. for a, for a cup yeah. of sweet feed. A cup of sweet feed isn't going to hurt them any more than you having a uh, you know one uh, a Hershey chocolate kiss a day. Yeah. Okay, that's not going to hurt anybody. It's when you have you know five handfuls or three Coca Colas a day or you know whatever. One one Coke a month isn't going to hurt anybody. But if you have three a day, then you know then you've got issues. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's the same thing here. So even though we have to feed silage right now still because of these um, extraordinary circumstances and us not having gotten to the place yet where we can be completely independent um, or have a buffer with hay like we want to because we're still not there yet we don't really have silage otherwise on the farm now chicken on the other hand you know my chickens are in the greenhouse right now chicken they love fermented food and it's good for them so one challenge with poultry is how can I feed greens to my chickens at winter time because um, it makes it's healthier for them you know it detoxifies them it makes a really nice yolk a really nice egg um, you just want your chickens to be able to get that so the problem that you run into is that um, you know after a few weeks of not feeding grass you know you see the yolks are starting to get lighter and um, in the winter time there's not really grass available and I personally I do not like having chickens go um, outside or have ex have them give them even access to go outside year-round um, chickens just don't like that that's not where they come from they need to, need to stay dry and they need to stay out of the wind and out of the wet snow and stuff so I keep my chickens completely in the greenhouse in the um, in the winter time. So what I've done with greens is I've um, taken alfalfa pellets and I've soaked them, and the chickens don't like it so much. So I, I always try to look, you know, what do the chickens like to eat? So what I've done is mixed it into their feed and forced them to eat that, which was not so nice. So I've had this thought for a long time, you know, to feed them fermented grass, basically to make little packages of silage in Ziploc bags or something like that um, and feed it to them one bag each day um, or you know you could maybe feed one you know every three days and you know if, if you have 150 winter days that divided by three so 50 bags you would have to make that's possible I think if you feed silage you know we don't want to feed silage but right now I can just throw them some of that stuff they could eat hay but you know if you're a chicken and you're used to eating you know wet moist grass and slimy bugs and then you get one of those dry hay pieces stuck sideways in your throat that's not very nice so I think that the um, kind of fermented grass moist grass would be much nicer for them so right now I just toss a, a handful of silage to them but otherwise you know if you have a vacuum machine I think I'm next thing I'm going to try to just take some grass clippings pack them down into these bags and then feed the bags every few days and that way I think my chickens will get fermented feed which is beneficial for their health they have a different digestive system than the cows obviously and um, I think that they're gonna love it and um, I'm gonna have dark nice yolks all winter long so health boost um, var variation in feed and fermented feed all that together hey guys My roost just collapsed um, before I got back here. Um, so I'll have to build some new ones and fix that. Um, these chickens are doing okay here. They have I've allowed them to have rest now for several months, which means they haven't been laying. They've just been resting. And remember, these are like three um, three years old now, or in their yeah yeah they're almost three years old. So. Um, they just started laying again. Um, we are getting about four minutes, about three to four minutes of uh, more daylight a day. It'll soon be like five and then six minutes a day. 
of more daylight and they're noticing this they're noticing that even though we're just a month away from the darkest day that is getting brighter and they've started to lay which is really nice to have farm fresh eggs again then I have my young pullets that I'm going to show you now as well okay do you guys remember where I raised my um, chickens where I've kind of created a little hatchery business well um, here you have young breast pullets that are gonna start laying now they have the right age um, and I just um, I have lighting here just ramp them up a little bit um, gradually um, to more daylight now so that they will start laying and um, here we have a couple roosters we will um, process them now except for three um, they are a really really nice size now to be um, used as a meat bird really delicious too you see here I gave them silage as well which they're enjoying and one thing I want to talk about real quick is yesterday or two days ago in the video I talked about um, the deep bedding for the let me do this so you guys can see me better I talked about the deep bedding for the cattle and um, the deep bedding for the chicken is a whole different story because um, that you want to be aerated constantly and um, the one health boost that I have found with chickens that just makes them grow so much better it keeps them so much healthier it just um, you, you just see the whole flock is just you know more more energetic more lively like just happier healthier you can just tell somehow when a when a flock of, of young chicks is just doing so well that has been adding ashes um, into this deep bedding system um, regularly and so what I've even done is especially at young age sprinkle ashes thin um, over their feed and over the the grid or the sand that you feed them for digestion and so they get that into the system it detoxifies them it just helps them so much it has made the biggest difference for me that is the number one um, thing and obviously um, there are lots of little aspects that will make for another video um, but yeah I'm super excited that these guys will start laying very soon um, they start laying at 16 weeks I've had um, breast pullets that had laid their first egg at about 12 weeks um, they're fairly small in the beginning like with most chicken breeds they take a little longer the breasts take a little longer to get bigger size eggs um, but when you ca when you calculate you know that these guys start laying 10 weeks before other breeds um, then you know they they have nice size eggs the same at the same t age as other breeds but you have had smaller eggs for 10 weeks before that so you know you can eat them yourselves or you can um, you know feed them back to chickens or what have you um, so it's, it's really not a negative in, in, in that way I would like them to have a little bigger eggs but maybe someday I will be able to create my own breed these guys are doing real well here they have the roosts back there they have water feeder silage they have access to grid and that's how I keep them here, away from the snow, away from the ice, away from the wind. Just very excited to um, have this spring come where they can go back out on the field. And hope you found this interesting and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye guys.